Hello and welcome to the Scooby-Doo Review. I'm your host, Zerk, though you may know me as Zerk Monster Hunter 4 on YouTube. With me here is my co-host, Pen. Say hello, Pen. Hello. I am from Iceland. Together, we have decided that every other Wednesday until we either run out of things to review or expire, we will review a piece of Scooby-Doo media. For today's episode, we've decided to give you some extra-length goodness for a long discussion on an astounding discovery we have made in the next movie in our run through the What's New era, Scooby-Doo in Where's My Mummy. So, without further ado, let's begin our suffering by summarizing the story. Before I begin the synopsis, I would recommend that you go and watch Scooby-Doo in Where's My Mummy, as without it, you kind of miss some crucial context. You may also want to watch another movie before you watch Scooby-Doo Where's My Mummy, but we will get into that later on in the show. Scooby-Doo Where's My Mummy begins in 41 BCE, a little bit more different than openings to other Scooby-Doo media, because it's prehistory and the Romans are invading ancient Egypt, forcing Cleopatra to flee for her life. After reaching the Great Sphinx uh, Giza, she, ca she goes below to her tomb and utters words to cast a curse upon all those who would defile Egypt. We then launch into the opening credits sequence, once again throwing through a myriad of familiar faces from the unit directors to our good friend, writer and director Joe Sikta, and composer Thomas Chase Jones, or Tom Jones as we've come to know him. <laughs> uh, Tom Jones does a really good job in this movie. Absolutely he does. After this wonderfully done credit sequence where we go through in an ancient Egyptian tomb, reminiscent of many films you've probably seen, we then end our credit sequence on an onk that is sealed within the rock, only to have the same onk be dusted off and we hear the familiar sound of a word. Jinkies! As Velma, suspended high above on the Sphinx of Giza, uh, probably with a research grant from school helping its restoration, discovers this golden onk with a ruby inlaid into it. After discovering it, she rappels down and asks the dig operator, Prince Omar, the literal prince of Egypt, to come check it out. After examining the cross for a moment, Prince Omar holds the onk to the sun, and the sun's rays reflect into the ruby, shooting a literal laser beam, as if by actual magic, at the Sphinx that releases a hidden staircase descending below into a strange tomb. Meanwhile, the rest of the gang are on their way to meet Velma, the mystery machine driving across the dunes of Egypt, like, I don't know, Sand Shark. They have missed her for six months, especially Scooby, so we get a nice sequence of Fred giving exposition. Unusual, especially because Velma's not there to give the exposition. Unfortunately, their van breaks down. Uh, a real classic cliche for why they're stuck in this situation. At this point, Scooby and Shaggy see an oasis and head towards it, but it turns out to be a mirage. They do this sequence with uh, a classical song that I'm pretty sure has been used before in Hanna-Barbera uh, productions, but I'm not, I, I just feel like I've heard it before. It's, Anyways, it's quite a famous piece. I'm pretty sure it's been used before in Tom and Jerry multiple times. I think that's oh, probably yeah. where we're recognizing it from. Anyways, carry on, Pen. As their radiator is broken, they find themselves trapped. However, a strange man appears out of the desert as if from nowhere. A man by the name of Ahmad Ali Akbar, nicknamed Triple A. And his hawk, Horus, appear and help them, uh, help them to find uh, Velma. He basically pulls them all on camels and gets them to the banks of the Nile River, which has mysteriously started to run dry. Triple A, confused by this, deep and cryptically uh, says this is as far as he goes. And he sets out to investigate the mystery of the Nile on his own, whilst giving the gang directions to how to reach the Sphinx from where he took them. The gang go up on a ridge and finally reach an oversea Giza, where the Sphinx and the Pyramids are located. It is here that they meet quite the character, in the form of one of Fred's favorite TV hosts, a man by the name of Rock Rivers, host of Fear Facers, where they face fear in the face and face it. 
Yes. Face. <laughs> Face. <laughs> um, this Rock Rivers character is attempting to regain his sh- his cancels his canceled show's credibility after he is canceled for faking his scares. Hearing rumors of an ancient curse deep beneath the Sphinx of Giza, he sets out to investigate it. After the gang clown on him for a bit, they eventually descend down into the dig site, where Scooby, raising hell after smelling Velma, eventually lands on the missing gang member, and the gang all reunite quite happily, only for Velma to inquire as to the motives of why Scooby and Shaggy missed her the most, when in fact she was the one who apparently buys all the Scooby snacks. A neat little bit of world building, as it were. Oh, yes, absolutely. Also, well, we'll we'll talk about this later on in the episode, I'm sure, but those Scooby snacks seem a little bit abnormal. Yes, they do. The gang are then introduced by Velma to Prince Omar, who explains about the tomb that they discovered beneath the Sphinx, why it's significant, and why they've been trying to hide it, and why the dig site is pretty much off-limits. He only permits the gang to stay because they're friends of Velma, and Velma has been such a great help to Omar on his dig. It is at this point Fred hears a strange noise. As over the hill, a helicopter flies over and two motorcycles descend into the dig site, kicking up a bunch of dust until they're followed by a jeep. The helicopter rolls over the Sphinx, and in a hostile takeover, two people descend from the helicopter, clearing the area and locking down everything, before a third figure, dressed in a white robes and a white sun hat and sunglasses, emerges from the landed helicopter. This, my fair viewers, is one of the best Scooby-Doo villains I've ever had the pleasure of introducing to you. This, my dear viewers, is Dr. Amelia Von Butch. One of the most kick-ass, just, oh, she is one of the best Scooby-Doo villains I have ever seen. She is also evil Laura Croft. As her, Amelia Von Butch's goons lock down the dig site, they begin to descend into the tomb. Now, it is also at this point that I would like to point out that several of the goons do bear a a semi-striking resemblance to several members of the animated series G.I. Joe. As they descend into the tomb, Amelia Von Butch reads some hieroglyphs that speak of an undead army rising and several people turning to stone if the tomb is ever defiled. However, while she's reading the hieroglyphs, she just puts like a tiny bit of C4 on the on the wall and after a little bit of monologuing she detonates it this seemingly unleashes spirits deep from in the tomb that escape into the outside world causing a sandstorm to to whip itself into shape above the tomb quite powerfully at this point Emilia von butch declares that nothing short of an army will stop her and though she spent most of this time chewing the scenery, everyone else is shocked and appalled that even after all of this, she would still go in deeper. The team is then beset by a sandstorm, seemingly caused by the uh, spirits that emerged from the tomb, and they are forced by this sandstorm to pursue after Dr. Von Butch and her cronies deep within the tomb themselves. Though, in this sandstorm, they soon discover that as they were forced inside to take shelter, Prince Omar was separated, and they find him turned to stone at the entrance to the tomb where Dr. Von Butch has already descended inside. The gang, quite fearful and questioning if the curse is real or not, eventually find themselves getting psyched up for their next adventure as Fred declares a mystery is on their hands. Velma objects at first, saying this is just too dangerous for everyone to partake in, but after some convincing and the discovery that Prince Omar's journal, which translates many of the hieroglyphs from the tomb, was in fact not turned to stone with him, the gang descends deep within. I would also like to state that Fred, uh, Shaggy actually states that he wants, he supposes that this is now the time to split up, and Fred, in a character moment, basically says, no, this is too dangerous, we're going together. But, of course, as is the Scooby-Doo way, they end up split later anyway. The gang uh, eventually descends into the tomb and catches up with Dr. Von Butch and her crew. There, Dr. Von Butch finds that the mural of Isis, embottled on the floor of the tomb, 
is in fact a massive pit trap that if stepped on would cause the whole floor to collapse. Naturally, Scooby and Shaggy, who are lagging behind the group, run into everyone and bolt everyone, including Dr. Von Butch and her cronies, straight onto the mural of Isis, causing the floor to collapse beneath them and separating Scooby and Shaggy from the rest of the gang, who are now stuck with Dr. Von Butch and her crew. It is also a good point that as the pit trap is collapsing, uh, Scooby, uh, Shaggy once again uh, taps deep into his weird, mysterious energy and power to do that thing where you jump on falling rocks before they fall so that you can somehow climb up while all everything is falling apart. This is not the first time, nor will it be the last time, that Scooby and Shaggy achieve flight. Especially even in this movie. It's at this point, the gang with Emilia Von Butch in tow begin to send her deep into the tombs while Scooby and Shaggy go into the other side uh, and begin poking around in some of the burial chambers, uh, probably for the servants of Cleopatra. The gang then hears a sound as Scooby and Shaggy appear to be in trouble, as indeed three mummies come to life, undead warriors, have been set upon them. Though there's no real time to deal with Scooby and Shaggy being fearful, as the entire army of the undead descends upon Dr. Von Butch's cronies, Fred and the girls. We get an excellent action sequence here between Von Butch's cronies, Von Butch herself, who does an epic dropkick on the undead general, which is just wonderfully animated and is a sight to behold. When Scooby-Doo movies actually get fight scenes, you know, you know shit's got real. Oh, oh absolutely, you do. And we are led into the movie's first chase. The end result of this first chase, after the gang, Von Butch and her crew, are all separated across the tombs by the army of the undead, ends with Shaggy and Scooby trapped in quicksand. Shaggy and Scoo being trapped in quicksand uh, quickly sink, but not before uh, one of the mummies manages to grab onto Scooby's collar and rip it off. Now, as they descend um, into the quicksand, they're... There is a thing that I can only explain that Scooby and Shaggy are actually just, like, Z-Warriors, because... Okay, so this pit of quicksand, right? It is on top of a sort of cave system, and it's been pouring out small amounts of quicksand for thousands of years, most likely. Now, rock that has held for thousands of years does not merely break underneath the weight of a teenager and his dog. They had to have punched it. I, I'm i sorry that this is a, a tangent, but this movie exemplifies too many things, okay? We'll get into it later. Later. Uh, Scooby and Shaggy uh, then fall again, riding through a sarcophagus, through essentially a water slide and a whirlpool. I don't know if coffins are watertight, but they sure as hell don't seem like it. They manage to find themselves in the Lost City, which, that's just its name. It It's just the Lost City. Doesn't have any other name than that. Where they are mistaken by the local ancient Egypt reenactors as the returning pharaoh Ascubis and his faithful manservant. Back with the rest of the gang, Daphne, Fred, and Velma are stalking through one of the tombs, uh, fleeing from the undead army, when... Velma trips and falls, losing her glasses. This leads to a small scene of Velma fluttering around for her glasses in the dark, leading her to end up in a small side chamber and being separated from Fred and Daphne for a moment. Then, an ominous hand hands Velma her glasses, only for a green flash followed by a very loud jinkies to be heard from behind Fred and Daphne. They run to find Velma, turn to stone. It has been established earlier that Velma had the golden Ankh necklace that she discovered earlier and unlocked the tomb of Cleopatra. This, thankfully, wasn't turned to stone with Velma, nor was Omar's journal, which translates the hieroglyphics. So Fred and Daphne take them both, saddened for the loss of their companion, deeper within the tomb. Shortly after this, they run into Rock Rivers, who also took shelter from the sandstorm by going deep into the tomb. As it turns out, he discovered a different chamber, namely the burial chamber for the army of the undead. Fred and Daphne note that it's suspicious how the army of the undead that is in this burial chamber, which appear to be resting after assailing Von Butch and her crew, actually still has cobwebs on it. And Fred 
and Daphne can't seem to reason that these would be the same undead warriors that chased them down uh, about an hour ago. Rock Rivers then points out an ancient scroll sitting upon a dais up at the center of the room. He goes to film it, saying that it's written in blood, to which gets a visceral reaction from Daphne. They use Omar's book to translate the inscription, revealing that the Ankh necklace is the secret to undoing Cleopatra's curse. It's at this point, however, that Dr. Von Butch appears. Having heard the translated inscription, she demands the necklace from Daphne. Daphne refuses, only for all of them to be interrupted by the formation of Cleopatra herself. She warns everyone to leave the tomb, or else they face her wrath. Which turns out to be a swarm of locusts. As they are running from this swarm of locusts, Fred and Daphne manage to get on a small motorcycle and escape, heading to a nearby town. Dr. Von Butch and her cronies, well, they manage to follow. As they get to this town, Fred and Daphne look around, and Daphne actually takes enough time out of her busy schedule of saving the world and figuring out what this curse is and saving her friends to buy a bag, which she stores the onk in. They are then assailed by a group of assassins. They are assailed and knocked out by some knockout gas concealed within a cane held by one large assassin. Later that night, Triple A, once again the same nomad that just randomly appeared out of the desert to save them from their broken down transportation, appears having to drag both Fred and Daphne from that small town to the top of a pyramid of Giza. To wake them up with some herbs. To wake them up with some herbs. He then sort of semi-ominously just sends his bird, Horace, to go find Scooby and Shaggy. Horace brings back uh, Scooby's collar that he had lost since the, um, since the mummy yanked it off and tells uh, Fred and Daphne to follow the bird to go find uh, Scoob and Shag. Scooby and Shaggy, in the meanwhile, have been lavishly enjoying uh, their uh, treatment as the returned and reincarnated pharaohs. They, however, are not privy to the rest of the prophecy, which... Hotep, ominously turning into another side of the wall, says is they will have to face his pet. Shaggy and Scooby are then later brought to a massive gladiatorial arena, where they are sat down and offered shields and spears. Uh, Shaggy and Scooby, of course a little confused by what this are, are immediately put on alert when Hotep declares that Ascubus must sacrifice himself to the spirit of the Sands. A massive gate is opened, and a giant green scorpion attacks Scoob and Shag, leading to the second chase of the movie. They eventually escape from the scorpion's clutches and trap the scorpion against a wall, which it bursts through and falls into the nearby river, malfunctioning and sparking, revealing itself to be a robot. Panicking, Hotep realizes that his ruse is up and a remote flies out of his sleeve, and Shaggy begins to undo the whole thing. It's at this point, Fred and Daphne and Triple A arrive in the Lost City, and Triple A declares that Hotep is an imposter cult leader uh, and known civil engineer, uh, Armand Granger, who has been diverting the Nile with illegal damning uh, to basically start a weird cult? Yeah, that's... Like, the only reason why he does it, I, there's no other reason why. It's not, like, for money or anything. No, he just he just wants water for his cultists, I, I guess. We'll get into him more later, because he is absolutely hilarious. It's, 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 a, it's an odd B-plot to have, but it does slightly matter towards the finale going on here. Yes. After this, Fred and Daphne sadly tell Velma has been turned to stone. This actually marks a very large character moment in Scooby-Doo in general because they actually have stakes. Velma is gone. How are we going to get her back? While they are still distraught, Fred and Daphne don't really know whether the curse is real or not as the River Nile disappearing was just some random civil engineer starting a cult in the middle of Egypt. All Everything seems lost, but Fred has a plan. With a little bit of encouraging uh, with the found caller on Scooby and the help from AAA, 
the gang sets out to finally confront both the army of the undead and Dr. Von Butch and get to the bottom of this mystery. Fred enlists the help of the Lost City ex-cult members uh, and sends them into the tomb ahead of everyone else, while Scooby and Shaggy head up to a different location to respond to Fred's signal. Triple A, however, waits outside with a trap set for whoever leaves the tomb. Scooby and Shaggy end up doing some hijinks with some of the army and the undead as they realize that Dr. Von Butch and her cronies were captured by the army of the undead and are being brought before the ghost of Cleopatra, who turns uh, Dr. Von Butch's two henchmen, a man named Campbell, who was previously seen crushing a Nokia phone into dust with his bare hands, and Natasha, a tech whiz from Mother Russia, who has been uh, also known to throw Fred with a perfect judo throw. Uh, just the second he, like, tried to challenge her. Both of them are then turned to stone, to which Dr. Amelia Von Butch begins to beg for her life. Shaggy and Scooby, watching this from afar, are in a room where they found a bunch of cement bags and some strange molds, but they pay no attention to this, given what is going on below. It is at this point they are signaled by Fred, and they swing across, uh the gap in the massive chamber to ring a huge gong with the eye of raw on it and fred lets loose a large boat seen in the opening that was the same one cleopatra used to escape to the sphinx tomb on and daphne as a disguised second cleopatra arrives to try and confuse and challenge the army of the undead as the members of the lost city also engage them in combat now the combat in general is actually quite nice now, this battle is actually cut short as Fred, with his giant comedy magnet, uh, manages to take all of the swords and weapons away from people because this is a kid's show. We can't stab people. Otherwise, it'd be stabbing. We, we can't have that. So, as Scooby and Shaggy are running away from the melee, they are actually tripped by some undead soldiers who roll Scoob and Shag into a carpet. This carpet... Uh, I guess, just gains the power of flight, and then Scooby and Shaggy start flying around, hitting people with their magic carpet. Cleopatra, the revealed form of Cleopatra, now fighting alongside her undead comrades to defeat the Lost City's denizens. She manages to get on top of the magic carpet, which is then split in half by the undead general, securing her safety. Scoob, Scoob and Shag then fall out of the air. Just, uh, <laughs> they fall out of the air right onto the ground as an axe flies through the air towards Amelia. Amelia executes a perfect backflip, cutting her bonds, and she runs away into Cleopatra's treasure chamber, where, as she has the onk in her hand, she inserts it into the keyhole. This reveals a massive treasure chamber, to which Amelia Von Butch is ecstatic to see. The gang and the ghost of Cleopatra all make haste to pursue her, as she is about to reach out for the golden crown of Isis, which was worn by Cleopatra. As Cleopatra's ghost confronts Amelia Von Butch, she grabs it and peels away with her grappling hook, declaring that she will be the sole survivor of Cleopatra's curse. As the room starts to collapse and the waters of the diverted Nile flood inside, the gang flees away in a boat as they are pursued by Cleopatra's ghost. Eventually, they fall out through the cave system and burst out in a cliff face nearby. They float down the Nile with Cleopatra in the boat with them, helping them row for some reason. Eventually, mm -hmm. they peel down and end up on the shore, whilst Amelia von Butch runs out into the sun about to put on the golden crown when Triple A's hawk wrenches the crown from Amelia Von Butch's hands and she is put in a trap that is springed up by Triple uh, A and rolled into a rug that she is then trapped in, yelling. Triple A declares that the desert still holds more secrets and the gang look at a washed up Cleopatra. It's at this point, Scooby's nose begins to smell something familiar. That's something familiar, being the smell of one Velma Dinkley, who has been Cleopatra the whole time! In an exciting twist and change from the, uh, the Scooby-Doo formula, one of the gang is actually the monster. 
And their reasoning for this is Omar, who is actually the undead general, they have been working together to safeguard Cleopatra's secrets from uh, outside treasure hunters, being namely Amelia Von Butch. They have been uh, orchestrating this whole ruse. As Velma is, you know, demasked, she goes into detail about how her plan worked. Apparently, the swarm of locusts was simply her knowing how to breed locusts from science class, which there's a lot of... That's way I, too many locusts. I call bullshit on that one, but... There's too many locusts. There's just, there's just too many locusts. Uh, Prince Omar then also goes on to explain that uh, Rock Rivers was in on the hoax uh, as his uh, film pr prowess and his ability to catalog the tombs meant that they could actually like peacefully perform archaeology rather than just boorishly going through it like Von Butch did. Uh, Omar then finally explains, now that the treasure hunters have been dealt with, they can finish reconstructing the Sphinx and the gang, who wasn't told by Velma, were done so because she didn't expect them to show up. And if they knew, who knows what might have slipped or how wrong it might have gone. Nonetheless, the gang all make up, and the Sphinx is unveiled, completely restored, only for Shaggy to launch a firework into its nose, knocking the nose off once again, even after the restoration, now causing this... everyone to look on in horror until Prince Omar sighs and says... I like it better that way. <laughs> it looks better that way. With a Scooby Dooby Doo, the movie ends, and so does our synopsis. So once again, Shaggy commits terrorism and the destruction of a national monument. Good job, Shaggy. <sighs> good, good job, Shaggy. You, you really, really did it. There, there is a lot to unpack here. Yes, <laughs> there is a lot to unpack here. So I, I think. I think, as usual, we should start with some of the more minor characters. So, Penn, uh, let's let's talk about Prince Omar and Rock Rivers first here. Prince Omar is a fairly bog-standard prince. Uh, although he does wield significant political power, it is all shattered when his Nokia flip phone is crushed <laughs> by a very large, burly black man. And... He can't find any other way to call the Egyptian government to help him as his dig site has been taken over by terrorists. That's that is about it for Omar. He doesn't actually do much of anything. He was the he was the undead general for most of it and yeah, he he's just a prince. I will say though, Omar as a character, he does get better on subsequent viewings of the movie because you understand how smart he is and actually what his approach is. Like you can really tell that his richness as the Egyptian prince really allowed him and Velma to perform this crazy awesome hoax. So retroactively, he becomes a much cooler character on your second viewing. But that's oh, neither that's neither here nor there since he really also doesn't have an arc. Uh, since simply because most of the film he plays the role of the undead general in cleopatra's army uh going on from that rock rivers is also an interesting character he serves initially as a bit of a red herring as having admitted to faking some of his footage uh daphne and fred separated from velma and quite easy to blame the next person they meet uh immediately jump at rock rivers and blame him for the hoax of the army of the undead and he basically says he doesn't have the resources to fake it even though he is in on the hoax he's not actively contributing it to it at this point he's he's interesting i like that he's basically yeah. the guy from fear factor <laughs> i think no that's, no i think rock that's hilarious River rock rivers is is quite a funny character but he only really shows up like twice and he doesn't really do much of anything in the film do like that his whole name being Rock is just set up for Fred to make a joke at the end when he's, they find him turned into stone. It's like, Rock has become Rock. It, it, it's such he's... a long, shaggy dog ass set up for that joke, but I Rock... just, it's so good. Rock Rivers, he's been turned into solid Rock. <laughs> 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 yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty good pun. Honestly, definitely. We whenever have... he's on the scene, he he definitely chews the scenery. And now before we before we to... move on to that can of worms, I would like to address a little bit about the gang and uh, Professor Butch's cronies. Uh, <laughs> it's really cool, actually, to see Daph 
like the gang always splits up in any Scooby Doo media, but it's really yeah. cool to see Daphne and Fred operate without Velma because basically the whole time they're doing that, everything goes wrong for them, and it really shows how much of a glue to the team Velma really is. So I thought that was a really cool subversion of the yeah, classic no. Scooby Gang trope. There are there are also several uh, p- points where it it's just um, the gang being friends, and it's great. Yeah. I really like those points. They're they're really nice. They uh they just feel like uh you know teenagers being teenagers even though they're twenty somethings. They're not. Come on, guys. They're not teenagers. They're like twenty five. Yeah. You kidding me? Yeah. Do, do they live in that van? Like where are they getting all this money from? Why is she in Egypt? What? <laughs> you don't hire a fifteen year old to do archaeological research in fucking Egypt? <laughs> yeah. No. No. They have to be twenty somethings. Like. Anyways. <laughs> Oh, actually, into- actually, no. I'm I'm going to talk about Scooby and Shaggy for a little bit. Oh, so, yeah. Scooby and Shaggy in this movie are fucking magic. They are magic. Now, this is part of our ongoing headcanon, which is to say that Scooby and Shaggy are actually mythical, super powerful beings. Uh, demigods, However, essentially. De- demigods. Essentially, Goku and uh, a, a cartoon monster, I guess. Krillin? Krillin, I, I, I suppose. <laughs> now, this is important. We will have an episode later on in our timeline once we're done What's New, the What's New era, where we will catalog all of the power scaling of every character that we deem worthy of it. Scooby and Shaggy possess the ability to fly in this goddamn movie. Multiple times. It Multiple times. Th- there is no justification given to the flying carpet. I don't understand how they do this. Look, right now... Scooby and Shaggy do not know of their powers. They are simply instinct animals. Now, later, they will ascend. They will know their true power, and they will use it accordingly. But that's... That's for later, my fair, fair friends. Now that that is done and over with, we have to deal with the can of worms. Yes. We've we've been beating the bush around... Mr. Triple A. He's one of the first side characters we're introduced to, and he's he's an interesting character because he appears to materialize from nothing alone in the desert with a set of camels. He's dressed in all black robes uh, with red accents and a very stylish turban, I might add, with a great beard. Just a great beard. It's a really great beard. He's a bit of an enigmatic character in that he helps the gang out when he first meets them, but the second something appears to be wrong with Egypt, he immediately becomes weird and ominous and kind of distant from the gang's troubles, despite being initially quite cordial. It's strange, really, to see how he operates, and whenever he shows up, it always seems to be at an opportune time when the gang needs their help the most. Triple A, in this sense, is very reminiscent of a character from another very famous movie that takes place in Egypt. It is at this point that I would like to remind our viewers to watch uh, Brendan Fraser's 1999 movie, The Mummy. For You will actually get it if you watch both of these movies together. Oh, fuck. Because, as it were, the character of Triple A, Amal Ali Akbar, and the character of uh, Armad Bray leader of the Magi in The Mummy, are both played by Oded Fair, an Israeli actor, and essentially fill the same role, wear similar outfits, and generally are just kind of the same dude. They are the same dude. They are the same person. One just has a longer beard and less tattoos. They are the... They are the look, look, okay, viewers. <laughs> it, it, once, if you watch these two together and you, and you see there's a conspiracy, viewers... Okay. Yes. yes, when we first watch this movie, we watch most of these movies twice uh, so that we can give them a close watch. I made an offhand remark that this movie is a sequel to the Brendan Fraser Mummy movie. Little did I know that after we went back and watched the Brendan Fraser Mummy movie out of curiosity, as Penn had not seen it, I think, in years, or if at all. I, mean, I hadn't seen it at all. We put on our tinfoil hats, and here's the thing. You tell a story in ancient Egypt about a mummy's curse, you're gonna have some story overlap. Like, that's that's just something that's bound to happen, just because of the concept alone. But when you have Oded Fair playing the same guy, basically, in these two movies, and these movies have incredibly similar plot beats, it becomes 
a little startling to realize. Like, okay. maybe we're just Jack. overthinking Scooby-Doo here, but I would like Penn to take it away for what is about to happen. Okay, lads, put on your tinfoil hats, because we're about to get crazy. In 1926, the mummy happened. This caused a nearly apocalyptic wave of disasters to erupt across Egypt. Of course, a government cover-up uh, a government cover-up was, uh, was unveiled and managed to keep the information about the true events about what happened in 1926 in the Brendan Fraser movie The Mummy secret. However, Amelia and Rick, the two, uh, the two protagonists of The Mummy, actually do, you know, hook up. They have a, they have a child in later versions of The Mummy, which we don't consider canon, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're children. Hey, their children probably grow up to be adventurers, explorers, tomb raiders, you know. Yeah. Say, like, Amelia von Butch. Mm-hmm. A renowned Egyptologist who knows her way around hieroglyphs, high explosives, guns, and being a cowboy. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, is Amelia von Butch is Rick and Evelyn's offspring from the mummy. It's it's uncanny, but if you watch it, 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 it makes sense. It, it's yeah. real. She spends most of the movie chewing the scenery, spitting out 90s-ass one-liners like she's freaking Brendan Fraser in the original mummy. She's shown to be incredibly intelligent and competent around Egyptian things. It's... It it works almost too well, and when you combine this with the role Triple A plays in the movie, and consider, consider, that the hawk Triple A is traveling around is Horus, a reference to the Egyptian god with a hawk as a head. In the movie The Mummy, uh, uh, Ahmed Bray, the character that Oded Fair plays in that movie, is separated from Brendan Fraser uh, and uh, Evelyn's brother uh, in the room with the Horus statue. This leads us to believe... Now, he appears at the end of the movie with no explanation at all of how how he survived being eaten by a bunch of mummies. So, we believe, at least I believe, that Horus knows that Egypt is in trouble. And he cannot allow... Like, the ancient god Horus knows that he cannot allow the mummy's curse to escape again. So, he revives the head of the Magi... To, to basically be a desert spirit, to help out Egypt when it needs it the most, when weird mummies curses are going around. And he decides to hang along as a hawk. It, 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 it's, it's just crazy conspiracy theories, but it works so, so well. It works too well, I argue. Also- it also works because Velma, Velma would probably have known of the the whispers of the legend of the mummy's curse. She may not have known who or Imhotep, the villain of the mummy. Well, he dies, but there is actually a person named Himontep in the movie, and he is occupying exactly the same role as Imhotep was. He's, he's the high priest. Yeah, he's of also cult. yeah, he's the high priest of a cult, and he's also bald. And yes. it is it is Triple A of all people, voiced by Oded Fair, to declare that is not Hotep. That is not Hotep. That is not Hotep. It, it's it just, like he knows. Okay. He, he just he knows. Okay. <laughs> you you gotta believe us. We're not crazy. Okay. It makes sense. Also, uh, Amelia von Brown, uh, Amelia von Butch's goons are literally GI Joe. They are they are literally GI Joe. There's a guy in a balaclava who could very easily, very very easily just be Snake Eyes. Okay, the big black guy. His name is Campbell, but he's just Roadblock. Think about it. Think he's about literally it. just Roadblock. The other background characters that are dragged away in the first like the first chase scene because they're bad at their yeah. job. Yeah, one of them looks like Sergeant Slaughter, one of them looks like Scarlet. It's it it's it it's hilarious that it's they're, just it's so blatantly G.I. Joe. They're, I, they're, I, they're just they're just G.I. Joe, man. They're just G.I. Joe. Like <laughs> it's, again on Amelia von Butch. She spends most of this movie just chewing the scenery and being like the most fun thing on screen. She has the charisma of a nineties action hero, which just totally evokes the Brandon Fraser mummy in like a spiritual way, not necessarily a physical way like Triple A does, which 
he has, uh, you know, she has blonde hair versus the, you know, um, I both think leads of the mum- both leads yeah. of the mummy were brunettes, so yeah, but it's, but but it works, just, just, just okay, it works, it works, it works a little too well, is all. Yeah, it does. <laughs> we said earlier that Amelia von Butch was one of the best Scooby Doo villains, and oh yeah, I I Definitely. feel like now that we've we've gone off the rails by talking about the Brendan Fraser mummy, we should we should come back on them and talk about just what makes Amelia von Butch so excellent. Absolutely. There is, there has not, I, I I can't remember another villain that comes on to the Scooby-Doo stage with a bunch of, like, armed goons. Uh, there, is, there is actually a couple of scenes, which I am almost sure that the editor forgot to edit out, where they do actually have guns in their holsters. Real guns in Scooby-Doo! Oh, also, Campbell just has grenades attached to his belt, which he never uses. Yeah. But, yeah, no, they, they are... They are evil. They use explosives to desecrate burial grounds. They're just so freaking cool. And yeah. for once, the monster isn't the villain. It's actually, well, the real villain is man is kind of the, the whole Scooby-Doo thing. Yeah, but... it's, it's the thesis <laughs> of the series, essentially. But when the, when, when the real villain is man, and in this case, woman, and she just does that much of a good job, you, oh my god, dude. Uh, Von Butch commits a lot of crimes in this movie. We'll go over everything she does in the scorecard. Um, but damn, she every moment she is on screen, she is spouting quotable line after quotable line. She is chewing the scenery, just being powerful. Like voice actress Christine Barinsky, she slays this part. Like slays it so hard. She just sounds like she is having so much fun just being this evil Laura Croft, and it's it's excellent. All of her lines are delivered with bravado and gusto, and it, it's it's just so cool. Not only that, but uh, there are multiple scenes of Amelia von Butch just absolutely kicking ass and taking names with these mummies, just beating the shit out of them. She probably gets that from her great grandfather Rick O'Connell. He constantly challenges the mummies. She is not scared of them whatsoever. She just fucking no. drop kicks Prince Omar. All right, <laughs> it disguised oh. as the undead general. And, and then she does a backflip to cut her freaking handcuffs on a flying axe. Like, what? What the hell, dude? <laughs> this woman is such a badass. When she's first revealed, like, she's also, like, super caked out, too. Like, literally, it's like, Scooby-Doo knocked it out of the park with this villain. She, she is top two Scooby villains for me. Like, I don't think anything can top Tim Curry as Ben Ravencroft for me, personally, but... She is like the closest second I could ever ask I, for, and I, 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 I really I hope that some someday we get a we get her in another episode of something because she's just so great. I I love her. Oh, she's so flipping fun, yeah. and I think. I, but I think we have just one more character, which is just Hotep, if I believe yeah. correctly. Voiced by Ron Perlman, uh, Hotep, uh, the leader of a cult. Uh, the only the only explanation to how he was illegally damming the Nile, uh, set up this cult in ancient Egypt, and uh, developed a massive robotic scorpion is that he is a civil engineer. That is he, the that's... only justification for anything he does. That's all he wants. He just he wanted a cult. Now I choose to believe, with my conspiracy ways, that Hotep knows about Imhotep, who is again the villain from uh, the Mummy. And he has been using the legend to manipulate the people of the cult that he created because he is Imhotep, right? Right? I'm not crazy. <laughs> he's, he's trying to, he at the very least looks like him. Like, I, I guarantee you the animators of this movie knew exactly what they were fucking doing. Like, oh, of course they did. Like, I don't, they... I don't think these high level connections are necessarily all true. Like, a lot of it is pareidolia, but at the same time, you hire Oded Fair and make his character look like that and play that role, you you knew what you were doing, animators. You knew I mean, what you were doing, Mr. Joe Sicta. You knew. Yeah, yeah, of course they fucking did. Like, it's just too close. It's just too close! <laughs> it, is, it is one of the most specific and blatant pop culture references Scooby-Doo has ever done, to the point where they literally hired the same guy. <laughs> it's just it's so good 
at at some point i i am going to just force people to watch these movies together because they they just make sense they, yeah they, no it's a like, it, honestly this is a better sequel to the to the brendan fraser mummy than the mummy returns was what sequels what 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 sequels zach it there it was just the mummy it was just a yeah, standalone so, so film you're, so, you're, so you're telling me i hallucinated the cgi scorpion dwayne the rock johnson dwayne the rock johnson isn't real zach oh, wake good. up you've been in a coma for 32 years <laughs> no <laughs> so <sighs> yeah i it, it's an interesting b plot uh i guess like it gives us a really cool chase later on i i find it interesting that they had this at all in the movie and that they had this entirely secondary villain uh that just uh it didn't really have anything to do with dr von butch but at the same yeah. time as a b plot and and a longer movie and just this movie is very well paced so the fact yeah. that this movie was able to accommodate that and not have it impact the the quality of the main plot or, or the main villain uh or her development just because amelia von butch is just oh my god dude like why did they make it slap so hard with her okay like she oh my god they didn't need to, they they didn't need to but they did anyway yeah they really didn't need to but they they did anyway and it's it's better for it because yeah. it's just whoa yeah oh it's so good yeah no the fact that the that the fact that the b plot in this movie doesn't actually take away from anything speaks to just how well paced this movie really is like this oh yeah yeah this this movie, it, 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 it really doesn't feel like the hour and 15 minutes like it is. Like, you're just watching it glued to your seat. Like, I, And again, the way that it subverts the Scooby formula all the damn time, oh man, it's so good. It's this, like, the, it's rare for a Scooby-Doo movie to, like, be good as, like, an actual normal movie. Yes. And when it does, you can just feel it, right? Yeah, like, no, and, it, and, it, and, this and, one works, man. Yeah. Oh, and, boy. Yeah. And and to me, like my gold standard is always the '90s direct-to-video era, and this movie, like it, it, it hits that. It hits yeah, that. It, it it lives up to it. Yeah. Um, I think we've spoken enough about the characters at this point, and I think we should get into the chases. Well, I mean, I could talk about Amelia von Butch all day, but if we must talk about the first chase, I suppose we can. Oh, we absolutely must, because the first chase is our new gold standard for chases. Yeah. This is the best chase that uh, we have seen since the first chase in Loch Ness Monster in episode one. Yeah. With that in mind, I would like all of our viewers to recall that in episode one, we gave that first chase an 8.5. So as we go in to describe that, I want you to think about what might have made this one win out. Absolutely. And you should go watch this too. So this is put to the song Mummy's Rags and Riches, which is this jazzy piece of... Mm. Yeah, it uh. it's it's like this bluegrass ragtime jazzy punch straight into your veins. Uh, and you get to hear the whole song as well. They don't mix it up or muddle it like they did in Chill Out. It, it's just the song in your face like Brothers Forever was on that first chase of Loch Ness Monster. And when they really lean into that, it produces great results. So right now we're seeing parallels with that first Loch Ness Monster chase. We got a hard-hitting song and you get to hear it and bop to it. Absolutely, man. They, the gags in this are absolutely wonderful. Uh, <laughs> um... This is also another chase that harkens back to the Shaggy and Scooby are magic uh, portion of this. For they get through a lot of traps without being hit once, yeah. I guess due to their preternatural yeah. reflexes. Yeah, they get through like arrow traps, fireball traps, like swinging axe traps, uh, falling doors, crocodiles, like... This this whole long hallway chase where Scooby and Shaggy go through basically like four times the temple from the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark in about thirty seconds to this jazz ballad is like oh it's just it's it, it it's not an assault of the senses because the action is very clearly flowing and it's very well animated and you constantly know how they're running it's just you get to see all of this you get these great shots cutting back and forth from the statues and you know shaggy and scooby are just running down this hallway of death for their lives being chased by these mummies and it's it, it it's great to behold because it's it's funny but it's tense at the same time i would I, also say that a lot of these traps harken back to a uh, sense of pulp adventure which is also what the mummy was. They're both kind of the same thing. It's a pulpy sort of Egyptian adventure. There's an army of the dead. Yeah, yeah. It's 
it's just a really fucking great chase, honestly. There's yeah. cross dressing in it, you know, shag and scoob, of course, dress up as women. And, 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 uh, and what I, I like about this is unlike the one in Chill Out where they dress up as like Santa Claus, right? Mm-hmm. It, the music doesn't change to accommodate it. Instead, the like bridge into the song where they play that classic Egyptian uh, sort of sand <laughs> theme that you've heard that you've heard in everything. That yeah. like feels like it's part of the song and like it actually bridges in and integrates well rather than stopping this song you're bopping to for this other song. It feels like part of it and then ramps back up and it's it's just a good Man. little it's, thing. It's so great. Plus the army um, of the undead themselves. Like just, Oh yeah. Like the fact that each mummy has its own unique design. Yeah, dude. It's and, oh and, and you can like everything about it and you can track where each mummy is because like there's a purple one there's a red one there's one with a specific headdress there's one with a spear one with a specific sword and like you can track where each mummy is and who's chasing who whether it's chasing von butch fred and the girls or it's chasing scooby and shaggy like they're they really pay attention to that sort of thing and it's it yeah it's just it's just so good it's obviously the so crew good. the crew put so much work into this yeah they really really did yeah. it's it's just it's just a wonderful thing to watch yeah honestly. no it's 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 probably the movie's best sequence like yes it, like watch this movie for this first chase and then watching amelia von butch uh as a oh, villain yeah. like like that alone makes this like this is one of the scooby-doo movies like if you're on the fence about like doing what we're doing and going through this whole retrospective if you're going to at least watch one or two movies from the what's new era put this one at the top of your list yeah and, oh definitely we gave that chase a nine out of ten because yeah. it's the best chase we've ever seen so yeah. thinking back to the loch ness monster episode it was an 8.5 this has surpassed it yeah. this is now the this is now the gold standard and yeah. we will be judging all other chases to this standard. Yeah. No, I'm, yeah. I'm curious as to when we'll get our first 10 out of 10 chase. Yeah, me too. But, but for now, this is this is excellent. Yes, absolutely <laughs> excellent. Let, let's move on to Chase 2 with the robotic scorpion, the Sand Spirit. Chase 2 is really really good just the music is again jazzy but it has female vocalists and background singers and it just has this kind of it's got this kind of groove you know yeah oh boy as uh shag and scoob battle this giant scorpion and get on this uh get on this chariot that they have to keep careening past corners the set piece of this one with the giant scorpion it separates itself from the army of the undead so you get a whole different experience the song is stylistically similar, but the female vocals and the more intense beat and that filthy bass line for this song, uh, just, oh, it just, it's so good. It's so good. And once again, they don't interrupt it. Like, there's one piece of dialogue during a solo that Shaggy says, and in that moment, though, it, it's a good piece of dialogue that really adds punch to the scene, and I think all of the gags involving the chariot are just really good. Though I think overall just apart from the chariot gags not all of the gags land as well as the ones in the first chase did and the scorpion design is super legit but the cgi that they use to sort of cut uh uh, the budget on the animation a little uh look look it was it was like 2004 also worth noting that both the mummy in this movie have yeah it's like it's kind of okay cgi you know (laughs) <laughs> yeah so there's like there's a couple moments where it's only the head or only the tail being animated that are 2d animated for the scorpion and those mm-hmm. those work really well but when you when we're dealing with the full 3d model of the scorpion you can you can really tell it's kind of janky and the tech is just not quite there yet uh, so that does bring the chase down a little visually uh so with not as many great gags and with a bit of visual hiccups on the scorpion though it can be forgiven simply because of the time period uh we gave that chase an eight for each of us oh yeah baby that one's that one's pretty good just because that music for us elevates it to a level above i yeah. feel like we really jam with with a chase when it's got some sweet sweet jams with it yeah I feel like this is a 7 out of 10 chase that gets a point up just because of how good the song is. Yeah, I'd say so. So the third chase happens very late into the movie, almost as part of the finale. Yeah. Uh, and it happens uh, shortly after Daphne, as a second Cleopatra, 
tries to confuse the army of the undead, which at this point the gang pretty much suspects are a hoax of some sort. Daphne is basically assailed and taken away, and we do get this nice jazzy groove once again, but it's not as high energy as the first two. And the lack of the vocals uh, with a lot of character dialogue gumming up this scene means it's just not as intense. Like, no. there was a chase like this in Loch Ness Monster uh, where it was just instrumental with some dialogue thrown in. But the the instrumental in that one was just so much better than this one. Like, it was much more high energy. And there were some lyrics mixed in when you got to groove to that instrumental. So I feel like the lower energy of this instrumental brings down this chase from what it could be. The flying carpet gag is good, and we talked about that a lot when we were talking yep. about Scooby Once again, they, they achieve flight. They are... There's no explanation. They, they must be gods. Really, really, this chase is, is largely elevated by the uh, fight choreography between the Army of the Dead and the uh, ex-cult members from the Lost City that Fred wrangled. That is, until Fred uses comically large magnet yes. uh, to, to make sure that there's no blood in this movie. Nope, that would be hard to explain to parents. Yeah. Is, is that Fred, Fred Jones stabbing a man with a spear? Not on my television. Yeah, although the comically large magnet is funny the first time you see it, it is kind of frustrating that you were robbed of the big battle scene you kind of wanted. Comically um, large magnet. Yeah. Uh, the set piece is good, <laughs> and Cleopatra's revealed design is legitimately great. Like, one of the cooler yeah, no. Scooby monster designs, honestly. And one of the cooler entrances is the crown, like, bifurcates, and, like, she reveals herself. It's like, nice. Yeah, Velma definitely isn't magic. No, that would... Mm, no, yeah. not magic. Uh-uh. So, if, if Velma were magic, that would make more things make so, sense. So, so even though there's a lot of good gags in here, uh, and the set piece is really cool, and the monsters are really cool, uh, just the music... The fact that the music isn't there, and it's kind of gummed up by the dialogue... Uh, what did we give this one, Penn? Yes, it was a 6.5, because it actually just goes under, like, the average, which, of course, is a 7, because everybody everybody's average is a 7 on a 10 scale. Come on. Yeah. It's at this point we get, basically, the actual finale, uh, as uh, Emilia Von Butch opens up the treasure chamber and causes the tomb to collapse in classic pulp adventure fashion. Uh, there's, like, legitimate danger and, like, some cool Temple of Doom vibes, also reminiscent of the finale in the Brendan Fraser Mummy, where the tomb also collapses. The tomb also, when the Ankh is put in, the tomb's hieroglyphics ignite as if by magic, because there's no other explanation. Yeah. Because it must be magic. Yeah. Look, that Ankh is magic. It, it reflected light off of a thing and just shot laser beams at the Sphinx. Ugh. God, this movie is amazing. <laughs> this is, this movie is hard to explain in a lot of yes. ways. But uh, Dr. Von Butch uh, escapes on her grappling hook and the gang are like forced uh, down the river. We get a really good gag as uh, Scooby and Shaggy's like, Cleopatra's after us and she's just in the boat rowing with them. Which is really cool when you realize that's just Velma helping them out. And also escaping with them. Yeah. Because you know she would die. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then seeing one of Fred's traps work, and uh, the dude from the Mummy say, "Do Fred's traps always work like this?" It's it's uh, it's it's a really good finale, and I think it I think it brings the movie back up to its standard after kind of the below average third chase. Oh yeah, definitely. It's that that chase is like the only thing in this movie that's mediocre and that's saying something it, it's not even mediocre it's like pretty good it's just the music's not there yeah. otherwise we would like it yeah yeah no that's 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 a that's a that's a seven out of ten that's a seven or seven point five out of ten chase that's brought down a point because of its music like oh yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. and i think that this the chases in this movie really show how music can make or break a chase because just how good the first two music pieces were compared to the third one it's it's a really it's a really interesting paradigm i would say so with the finale covered uh our chase is rated do we have any final thoughts about this movie pen um having watched this with the mummy i will never view the mummy the same way again because the mummy is actually is actually just a, a prequel to this film i i firmly believe that it's it must be true i'm not crazy i'm not crazy <laughs> I agree. Uh, this movie is 
this movie surprised me. This is one of the I I, I often talk about. Uh, I I talked about this with Chill Out and then Unlock Ness Monster, but of the Scooby Doo direct to video movies that I had as a kid and actually had on DVD. I remember having this one, and I remember watching this one a lot with my younger brother, uh, and I remember always enjoying this one, but coming back to it now, coming back to it after having seen the Brandon Fraser mummy, uh, having appreciation for the casting choices, having appreciation for just how amazing Dr. Von Butch actually is as a villain. Oh, she's, she's so kick-ass, man. She's, she's so good. She is so good. <laughs> we in this house simp for Dr. Von Butch. Uh, and the Hex Girls. And the Hex Girls, yes. And Shannon Blake. Oh my god, dude. When we get to Legend of the Vampire, this like, oh my god, when we get to Legend of the Vampire and Witch's Ghost, like, the, the simping is going to get real okay like pen lost his mind about the fucking brendan fraser mummy you have not seen shit yet on on the scooby-doo review i tell you this right now F my final thoughts is this movie t kicks ass dude it's, this movie does kick ass like it kicks so much ass <laughs> like this this surprised me like mm -hmm. i knew chill out was good i knew this one was good i knew loch ness monster was pretty good but like again when a scooby-doo movie is like actually a good movie, not just a good Scooby Doo movie. You can feel it, and yes. I I I feel it with this movie. <laughs> like this was great, honestly. Oh, it was great. It was so so good, man. And I think that that's our. I think that that is uh, is it. Yeah. Now then, it's time for the scorecard. <laughs> We had an average of 7.8 out of 10 for the chases and a 9 out of 10 for the whole movie. There was no Scrappy, no Tom Kenny, but the gang did commit terrorism, which now I am adding to the scorecard. I'm sure more wacky stuff will come out of the scorecard as we go on. Yeah. And now we have the crimes of Amelia Von Butch. Grand larceny, attempted murder, attempted regicide, destruction of historical site, grave robbery, terrorism, possible weapon smuggling, destruction of personal property, kidnapping, and violent assault. Damn, Thank girl. You. You're going to jail for a long-ass time. <laughs> <laughs> She's never, ever going to get out. And that's the episode. Thanks for listening. And remember, we wouldn't have a podcast without those meddling kids and their dumb dog. Thanks a million. And remember, you can always email us at the Scooby Doo Review at gmail.com for fan mail or requests or anything. 